Good morning, church. Welcome to worship here online at the Congregational Church of Middlebury, Vermont, United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming congregation, which means no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, just as you are. I want to lift up two important programs that we will be having this summer at church. Um, we're really excited about it, and we hope you are too. First is the Spiritual Autobiography Project. The idea is that you, along with a small group of people led by me or Andy Lloyd, Andy Naj Benson, Larry Jones, or Steve Jewett, will read a spiritual autobiography. Then you will have a chance to, during the month of July, write your own spiritual autobiography, and then finally present that to your small group. If this sounds interesting to you, please do sign up um, online. There um, was a link sent out last week. Um, if you have trouble finding that, you can call Judy and she'll be happy to help you. I also want to invite you to our midweek morning prayer that starts this Wednesday at 9 a.m. over Zoom. I will be leading that service for most of the summer, and there you can expect to find um, time to reflect on scripture, time to share your prayer concerns, um, and maybe even some music. We would love to have you join us in this way. Um, it will be a great way for us to worship together live as a church. There will be a link sent out inviting you to that Zoom worship um, tomorrow morning. Finally, I just want to give a shout out and some love to our own Andy Lloyd, who each Saturday puts together these um, individual worship segments to form one beautiful worship service. Andy, we are so grateful for you. Thank you for sharing your time and your talents each weekend for us, for us as a church, um, and we don't take you for granted. So friends, now let us enter into a time of silence as we begin our worship this morning. call to worship. O oh, feed me this day, Holy Spirit, with the fragrance of the fields and the freshness of the oceans which you have made, and help me to hear and to hold in all dearness those exacting and wonderful words of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, follow me. If we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him, for only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ, who bids us follow him, knows the journey's end. But we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Thank you. 
In the first letter of John, the author writes, If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us. With confidence in God's mercy, let us pray, first in unison, then in the quiet of our hearts. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have, have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Friends in Christ, return to God. For the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. By grace, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia and Amen. Good morning, church family. Do you miss our children and youth? Yeah, so do I. So I have some really good news for you. Next Sunday is going to be Children and Youth Sunday. In these ever-changing times, we decided it was just one thing we were not willing to give up. And although it may look a little different, and yes, certainly will be online. There will be some familiar elements. You will hear some prayers written and delivered by children. 
The sermon will be written and delivered by a graduating senior. Thank you, Mary Naj Benson. There will be musical performances by the youth. And we will take a moment to recognize our 15 graduating seniors. I really hope that you'll be able to join us for what I'm sure is going to be a beautiful service filled with joy and hope. Now, I would like to invite any children at home to come forward for a children's message. Good morning, children. It's really, really great to be here with you, as always. A few weeks ago, I shared with you a pin that someone in church school had made for me. And it said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, today I'm gonna share with you another pin that someone in church gave to me. And it says, I have a dream. Hmm. I have a dream. Well, those are pretty simple words. I have a dream. Yet they're also very, very powerful. I bet you've heard that phrase before. I have a dream. And I bet you know who made it famous. I have a picture to help you. You guys know who this is? You should. He's one of my favorite people and I talk about him quite a bit. So it's Martin Luther King Jr. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Martin's Big Words. And the story time group and I read this on Thursday. And I've been thinking a lot about Martin lately because I've been hearing and seeing Martin's words. Things like, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Without justice, there is no peace. And the time is always right to do what's right. You see, as a nation, we're in some very troubling times right now. And there are a lot of people hurting. And there are a lot of people crying. Crying out for change. Change that is so long overdue. Martin's words were powerful 60 years ago. And they're still being used today, and they're still powerful. And to be honest with you, it kind of reminds me of another person that I love and admire and talk a lot about, whose words are also very powerful and also still being used today. Jesus. Jesus's words are over 2,000 years old. And the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven was, Go out and teach my commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. I think that's what Martin was trying to do also. Did you know that Martin has a much longer name? It's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. He was a reverend. He was a pastor, just like Pastor Andy, just like Pastor Elizabeth. He studied the Bible. and He preached the teachings of Jesus. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that Jesus had a dream for all creation, too. And I think it was really similar to Martin's. I think they wanted us to love one another. No exceptions. You love everyone. You don't love them based on the color of their skin, on what religion they believe, or what their gender is. No exceptions, love everyone. So that was their dream. I'm wondering if you have a dream for the world. I bet you do, and I bet it's a really good one. So a few members of the junior youth group and I are going to meet after church today. We're going to make some posters 
and we're going to hang them on the windows of our church so that our community will know where we stand in terms of racism. Because our words and our actions matter. So I want to invite you, if you want, to make a poster at your house. Something that you're dreaming for for this world. Something that will make this a better, more just place for everyone. And if you want me to, I will happily stop by your house wearing my mask and I'll pick up your poster and I'll bring it to church and I'll hang it up with the others so that we can let everyone know where we stand as a church community. Will you please join me in a prayer today? Dear gracious and just Lord, thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy in our lives. Thank you for the powerful words of Martin Luther King Jr. and of Jesus Christ. Help us to use words to stand up to others who aren't being fair. Help us to create a more just and equal world. Remind us that there is always a better way and that change is possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. It did not occur to me until later that night, but for about an hour on Thursday evening, the news cycle stopped spinning in my mind. For a good hour, I was not consumed by the national news. Sure, I was back at it before too long, thinking about Christian Cooper just trying to bird watch in Central Park, and Ahmad Arbery just trying to go for a jog, and Brianna Taylor just trying to get some rest. Thinking about the eight minute, 46 second moment of silence at George Floyd's memorial service. Thinking about the 400 year long arc of slavery and public lynchings and Jim Crow and the thinly veiled war on drugs and the mass incarceration of people of color. But for an extended moment on Thursday evening, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about our daughter and her sixth grade classmates. My family and I watched the Weybridge School graduation from our car in the parking lot, windows rolled down so we could hear. It was different, for sure. But for all the sensible changes made to this year's ceremony, one tradition remained. 
Yes, they wore masks, but as in years past, each sixth grader stood at a microphone and shared with us their lupin, not the flower. These lupins are short graduation speeches and performances, presentations inspired by the beloved children's book, Miss Rumpheus. So for the better part of an hour, these tweens bravely displayed what matters to them. A love for this, a passion for that, a special skill, a song, a story. Different ways that they, like the Lupin lady, Miss Rumpheus, can make the world a more beautiful place. I hardly need to tell you what that did for my heart. It was not an escape from reality. It was real and really powerful to listen to a class of 12-year-olds give voice to the joy of contributing something good to the good of the whole community. Honestly, listening to those children felt to me like a welcome dose of gospel medicine. I would also say those lupins opened up for me a path to the heart of this morning's gospel lesson. In today's reading from the end of Matthew's gospel, a passage called the Great Commission, the risen Lord sends his disciples to make disciples. Go and make disciples, says Christ. Now, it needs to be said that that directive has led to unchristian manipulation of non-Christians, and still does. In the long, rich story of the church, there are heart-rending chapters that chronicle blatant coercion and conversion by force which is why I have long felt uneasy around those words, make disciples. Making disciples is not always pure, not always in alignment with love your neighbor as yourself. That's true. So is this. We are called to make disciples. So how do we do that? How do you make a disciple? What does that mean? Well, here's what it means to me. It means leaving an impression of unconditional love on the people you meet and on the company you keep. It means leaving in your wake echoes of joy and kindness and compassionate care. It means impressing upon others that they are beloved, that they belong. It means teaching our children well. It means walking alongside our youth as they make their way across the bridge called becoming. It means having a good handle on the good book knowing what Jesus actually said. It means bearing witness to the life of Christ by giving the hungry something to eat, by giving the thirsty something to drink, by welcoming the stranger, no matter who they are. It means listening to understand and walking humbly with our God. As I see it, making disciples starts with being one. It starts by taking stock of our own pantries, by asking ourselves if, if our treatment of others bears resemblance to the way Christ treated people, by asking ourselves 
if what we're putting out there every single day is making the world a more beautiful place. Making disciples is not about imposing or inflicting anything on anyone. It has to do with knowing the heart of Christ and taking on the character of Christ so that others may feel closer to good and closer to God for the time they spent with you. Some will want more of that living water and may in their own time find its holy source. Some will not. Some could care less. But either way, our job is clear. We are commissioned by Christ to carry out the great commandment of Christ. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are sent by Christ to send all the good we can into a world that is starving for real food and real peace and real justice for all. So that's what I'm thinking driving to church early Friday morning. I park near the entrance on North Pleasant Street. I walk inside, a little bit on the sleepy side. My coffee smells good. A short while later, I see Officer Mason through the windows of Unity Hall. He's out there looking at something or maybe for something. I like Chris. I go outside to see him and to see what's what. He tells me there's a swastika drawn with chalk on the sidewalk in front of our church sign. And there it is, a swastika on the sidewalk in front of our church sign. I retrieve some water, I wash it away, I go back inside. <clears throat> a few hours later, I hear familiar voices outside of Unity Hall. Among them, two young adults raised in this church, and they've got some chalk too. And they are redeeming our sidewalk with words that Jesus could surely get behind. Where the swastika was are the words, love lives here. Love lives here. Love lives here. Young adults raised in our church, making the sidewalk and the world more beautiful. That's what disciples do. And that's how they're made. Amen.
for all those blessings that we know and can name, for God's holy generosity that refills our cups morning after morning, for loved ones, for our church family, for our communities, let us give thanks to God with a fullness of heart. Thank you for offering your gifts in support of our ministry. Bless you as you make this offering to God. Let us pray. Holy and loving one, 
during this time of prayer, open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to your presence with us. Gracious God, we have so many prayers. There are so many things for which we long, things we hope for, things we are working for, and things we cannot do alone. Give us the persistence in our work of building your kingdom, of love and peace and justice. Let us be co-workers with you, O oh God, dreaming your dreams for the world, sharing your love, and trusting in your faithfulness to us. Today, we ask for your healing during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. For those who have been infected by the virus, those who are recovering from it, and for families who have suffered great loss due to this virus. We ask for your protection for those who every day go out to serve in, in this time that makes them incredibly vulnerable. For our first responders, medical personnel, grocery store employees, social workers, chaplains, and other folks deemed essential workers at this time. We pray for law enforcement in Middlebury and around the country who so often do serve and protect communities well. We pray especially today for our own Chief Hanley for Walter Stooges' friend Steve and others. We are grateful for their service. And we also pray for systemic changes in the police departments throughout our country that enable racism and excessive use of force. May we all repent for our complicity in racist systems of oppression. We pray for our children in their last week of school who have had to adapt over and over for months on end. We pray for our parents who have done their best to educate and provide for and nurture those children. We pray for our teachers in their final week of a challenging school year. We pray for our older population who is at greater risk for contracting this virus and for those isolated in our nursing homes and care facilities. We pray for our leaders who are charged with the task of reopening our society in the safest way possible. God, may your Holy Spirit guide them. Oh God, we pray today for those who are sick, suffering, and dying. For Al Stiles, Bill Cochran, and Bill Campbell. We pray for the family of Jim Douglas, who lost his mother this past week for those with chronic pain and mental illness, for those with addiction and substance abuse issues. Surround them, Holy Spirit. Bring them comfort and love. On this day, when we are invited to make disciples of all nations, we ask that you first make us disciples, O Christ. Transform us as individuals and as a people. Move in and among your church to bring healing instead of death. Move in and among us to bring justice and solidarity instead of hatred and division. Help us to have the courage to call the sins of racism and white supremacy and anti-Semitism anti what they are, plaguing sin, and to move us to actively work against it in your holy name. God of the margins, help us to speak out rather than staying silent. Help us to walk alongside one another and speak words of truth and love so that we can move towards a more peaceful reality where all people can thrive. Holy One, we need you now more than ever. Help us to listen and follow. Move us from where we are and teach us to how to live as better people, better disciples of you. We ask all of this in the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Friends, let us hold a moment of silence together as we prepare our hearts and minds to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Today, we gather with one another and with Christians of every time and place. We gather around a table that is as wide as God's mercy. There is room for you here. There was always room for you and for all at the Lord's table. As Jesus ate with sinners and saints, so are we invited to delight in the living presence of Christ. May we rise from this table and our tables to live our faith, to be bread for a world that hungers for peace, to be a cup overflowing for those who thirst for justice. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right, always and everywhere, to thank you, God. You are the author of life, the artist of ongoing creation. With wonder and awe, we thank you and we praise your holy name. God, we thank you for Jesus, who meets us where we are and shows us the height and depth and breadth of love. In the sharing of this bread and cup, we remember him. God, we come to this table as people who know well that everything is not well for everyone, everywhere. And yet we come as people who trust that you are with us, embracing us in times of sadness, calling us beloved, and equipping us for work that awaits us. For the ballast of faith, for the persistence of hope, for the great power of love, our hearts sing. Hear our song, O God, and hear our prayer. Amen. And so, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. After giving thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. So today, with Christians everywhere, of all time and place, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and fruit of the vine, that we may be united with Christ and with one another. Nourish and aliven us with this sacrament, this visible sign of your invisible grace, that we may be faithful in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Friends, the gifts of God for the people of God, come for all is now ready.
Pastor Elizabeth and I invite you now to share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you have something to eat and drink close at hand, let us keep the feast as we say these familiar words. The body of Christ, the bread of life. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Gracious God, in gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Ask much from us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. Amen. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve God and neighbor. And go with the knowledge that you are loved with a love that never ends. God bless you. God bless us all. Amen. <laughs>